Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm seeing lots of familiar faces from yesterday. And I'm really happy that you came back for our session. I mean, I guess that means that yesterday you found very productive and helpful. Um, I, our session was originally scheduled uh, entitled Incorporating Active Learning into Your Classroom. And I'm going to cover a little bit of that. However, I realized that really what you guys are wanting to do is basically how do you do a course transformation? How do you start incorporating? What are the things you need to think about? What are the things you should um, be aware of and things that happen with going on? And so I'm going to cover such things as de uh, development of the course, implementation of the course, evaluation. I'm not going to cover as much because we discussed that yesterday. Then talking about how do you make a course sustainable? What is going on for this? So then I have some resources like books and stuff I'm going to pass around, some things that are, are going on. And then we are also going to look at what it means we're going to form a professional development community. community. And I'm going to lead, guide you through some of the steps of what we're going to be doing. And um, Monica and I set up the community this morning, but we have to figure out how to get you guys all added to it. So what we'll probably do is send around a piece of paper and get your names and email addresses if you want to be part of this professional development community so that we can then add you to it. But I'll give you, I'm going to go over, if we have time, an overview of what's happening. Um, now, unfortunately, I may not be able to have as much active learning pres presentations. We'll try and do where we have time just because I want to make sure I get the information across to you. And so I'm trying to, first part of the thing I'm going to answer, talk about active learning. Where does that fit in? We've already talked about active learning a bit in, in with what our courses are and how we covered the stuff we covered yesterday when we talking about student-centered courses. And we're going to go into a little bit more, define things a little bit more formally, and then I'm going to switch gears and go into course transformation. If we have time, there's going to be activity for you guys to work on for figuring it, to get started on this uh, course transformation ideas. It sort of plays on what we developed yesterday in session C. Before I begin, are there any questions? Again, turning around. Hands go up when I turn around. Hopefully, you all appreciate my jokes by the end of this. They're sort of dumb. OK, so no questions. I have to count. I have to keep turning until I count to 12 in my head. And remember, it's 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. You got to be slow because people sometimes really do have questions. And it takes a while. So remember yesterday, for those of you who are here, there's one where I turned around like three times and then somebody raised their hand right at the, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. OK, so let's get started. I want to review a few things just on some of the things that we talked about yesterday to give you a chance to write them down. Um, scholarship of teaching and learning. Remember that it's basically approaching your teaching in a scholarly manner and sharing it with others. It's not just, I mean, I did not make that clear yesterday. It's also disseminating your results. Because when you perform research or scholarship, um, you write your papers, you share it with others, you go to conferences and present your information, and you do similar things with your scholarship of teaching and learning. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, this is something where there are conferences, where you can go and meet with other people in the same field as you, as well as outside the field, and talk about what how are you approaching your teaching in a scholarly manner and how things are going on? Um, again, it's not truly pure education research because it's not as it may have a theory component into it, but you are not working to develop theories, not willing to working to expand the knowledge base in the leaps and bounds that education research is. Because you're not doing this full time. Just want to make the comment. OK, just a reminder, difference between assessment and evaluation. This is something that I keep wanting to hammer into you guys. Because when I talk about it, it's easy to get these two terms confused. And a lot of people use these terms interchangeably. So for example, assessment is measuring if the students are learning from a learning module. This is for something you do for the students. This is what Jeff covered in session B yesterday, or session two yesterday. Um, and again, we have different types, formative and summative. Can anybody tell me, does anybody know what the difference between formative and summative is? Um, yes. Formative. Formative is the evaluation that you make it to students, but you give them feedback. Mm -hmm. Summative is just, just give them the grade. So one of the things, 
help, I help remember this is summative. I mean, it's the sum of their feedback, or sum of their, your assessment of their learning. Now, you said evaluation. That's what we're going to try and keep saying, not saying evaluation and assessment. Again, it's so easy to mix these words up. That's why I keep hammering this. Okay. Um, formative is what you're doing as they're forming their ideas. You're giving them feedback. Oh, you're doing this. One of the nice things about these um, students in your classrooms, taught in rooms like this as well as others, is that you can go up to them and catch them while they're trying to work on an issue or a problem and actually help them if, and give them formative feedback right there along the way if they're struggling. Um, and we'll talk about things like that as well. Evaluation, on the other hand, is when you're me measuring the effectiveness of the, your teaching process, measuring the effectiveness of the learning modules that you've created and this course components that you've created to see how effective they are at meeting your course goals. Any questions on evaluation and assessment? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so yesterday you mentioned, uh, when talking about evaluation, about uh, primary trait analysis. Yes. And I want to develop like this primary trait analysis further because it's not completely clear in this moment for me. So um, if you're more interested in primary trait analysis, when we are finished here today, if we end up having time at the end, I'll do it then. If not, what we'll do is I'll just be bringing up some of the slides and talk about what it is and give you the reference at, um, during the, before, before we head to lunch. Because yes, primary trait analysis is a very effective tool and it is something that I found very powerful, and I have example. I, I actually um, gave a um, colloquium last spring at Wake Forest University in um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in the United States, and I started talking about this primary trait analysis and how we can do it. So I have slides from that talk that actually breaks it down in what we're doing, and I think that'll help you a lot. Other questions, comments? Turning around, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. You guys aren't, you're not laughing at me. 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. See, Luana's laughing at me. <laughs> Another question? All right, so let's get, head on to our active learning. Okay, active learning. Now, I have these up here because I know some of you are not native English speakers, and so I am not putting the builds in, so you can slowly work at uh, reading this and trying to process the information as you're going through. Okay, active learning. Active learning is occurs when students actively mentally engage with the learning process. They are not sitting back in a lecture chair listening to you talk, although that's what you guys get to do for a little while today with me. But I try and encourage you by asking questions, giving enough time, having you maybe work on something as a group, that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times, this is referred to, you can find this in the literature, one of the common phrases is minds-on, hands-on learning. There are a lot of these education phrases and stuff that are sort of like a buzzwords. We talk about inquiry-based, discovery-based, active learning-based, but active learning is this thing that basically means you're actively involved in the learning process. You're actually committing to it, cognitively processing things and learning the process. Okay, student-centered courses, by their very nature, require active learning. Because if the majority of the learning emphasis is on the student and what they're doing, if it's, and that's what it has to be to be true for student-centered, then you're going to be able to have, that by its very nature, it's going to be active learning is occurring where the professor or instructor is acting as a guide on the side, to minus a phrase from yesterday. And so that's happening. Also. Classroom design. We're going to learn more about this this afternoon, but just to give you a brief over here, classroom design facilitates active learning. So I just want to show you some. Um, I'm going to show you some classroom designs. I'm going to skip down the slide and then we come back. So you have large lecture halls. So when I was told I was teaching a large, anybody taught in a situation like this? When did you do it? Not here at EFIT, because everything at EFIT is much smaller classes, which is awesome. It wasn't, it wasn't here. Yes, where was it? It was in, um, in the Smithsonian. In Smithsonian? A, yeah, in a very big oh. auditorium. 
it was scary. Yes, <laughs> it's very scary. You walk in this room and you're like, oh my God. They're all here sitting to listen to me talk. Notice that the instructor, um, fortunately I don't have a laser pointer, but the instructor on the side here is, he's sitting up here talking. And students are trying to do it now. Do you think all the students are listening and actively writing things down? Do you think he can tell if the student back here is actually processing what he's doing? Can he tell by making eye contact? He, no, he can only really see the students in the front rows. Horrible learning situation. Can you do active learning in a classroom like this? Yes, you can. You can look at it a little bit more when you look at this kind of situation. It's a little better lecture hall. Still lots more seats and heart. You need to be working on that. So we're going to talk about this this afternoon. Here is like a scale-up classroom, very similar to this one. I actually found one where they have the same chairs. <laughs> OK. Interesting thing about it, notice how actively they're participating. Some people are working together. Some people are talking, presenting information, working on the whiteboards. We did this yesterday. Some are using the huddle boards. Those other whiteboards we provided at the table for you. And it's going around. And you can even find places like this. Starts out uh, lined up in a row with a little chairs, so it looks like a basic classroom. If students sit down, then you ask them a question, say, turn to your neighbor, and they can literally turn their chairs to the neighbor. It's great. Sorry, I love these little chairs with the tables on them. They're awesome. Um, anyway, so that's sort of going on. So how do we make this happen? So we're going to be talking about this this afternoon. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. OK, when you want to encourage active learning, you basically need to understand how students learn. Um, the National Research Council of the United States actually worked and worked with top-notch research scientists and others to produce, uh, produce a book called How Students Learn, or How, how Learning, How We Learn. And um, it's actually got parts where they have se separate books you can buy for mathematics, science, history, things like this. So more, how are they learning these additional concepts? So a couple of things you need to know. I'm basically, this is Active Learning 101 really fast. OK, so two basic things you need to know. Learning is a individual, well, I'll take that back. When students need to form their own individual understanding of a phenomenon, a concept or something that you're introducing in class. So you have to be able to sit back and they need to be able to bring that in develop them themselves. As I said, with non-active learning environments, they're having to do that on their own. And it's often fraught with mistakes that they don't realize they're making until they go to an exam. And then they do poorly and you get this sense of frustration, things like that. So if you want to learn more about this uh, mental models and formation and everything, uh, the whole entire field of cognitive psychology touches on these things and how students learn. OK, the other thing is we need to do it ourselves, but we do it better if we work with other people. Because learning is also a social process. It's what's called social cognition, the working with others to help learn. I know some people say, well, I'd rather work on my own. Here's the thing, though. You can take four people, form them into a team. And if you do it right, those four people are greater that individual team is greater than the sum of the parts. So they're going to do better. They're going to be able to reach new highs in understanding. They're going to be able to master material better. And it actually comes out working. So you can do active learning one-on-one individually. But you really need to be aware that social interaction really makes it stronger. So that's why we talk about working in teams so much, because having that social interaction you know, because if you do it individually, they're just sort of doing it by themselves and may not be actively engaged in it. The other people challenge them to become more actively engaged in the material. Okay. What's that? It's not just competition. We're gonna so he's asking, is it about competition? We want to discourage competition in some cases. Competition is good. Um, one of the things they talk about, um, some of the founders of this kind of teamwork framework and talking about these things, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson who were researchers, um, cognitive psychologists and stuff, 
up at the university, or educational psychologists, up at the University of Minnesota. They actually um, have worked for a while, and they wrote a book called Learning Together and Learning Apart. And both are both are important to the process. Because you may, if you store your knowledge in working with the other person, what are you going to do when you're taking a test by yourself? Thank you. Sorry, I like my soda in the morning. <laughs> you guys drink coffee, I drink. I drink my caffeine cold. All right. So yes, there is learning together and learning apart. And so there is some competition that comes in, especially if you're having them work on individual exams. And if you're basing your grading scale off of what the average on that exam is, not using a straight scale, that, that inadvertently produces more competition between students. But we want students to work together so that we're not competing against them. We're just all trying to succeed so everybody can succeed together. Is that answer? OK. Other questions? Yes. Maybe the problem sometimes for us is uh, if how you qualify, how you give the the quantification of each person. I mean, it's nice to to work together, and when you want to give uh, some score, um, you you try to be not so subjective about it. But anyway, uh, you 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 just recognize who is better than another, but you have a, a work together, so. So one of my things that I do when I use teamwork in my classes is everybody on the team gets the same score. However, um, I also do a thing where when the teams take their individual exams, if the group average is above 80%, every person on the team gets a bonus points. This is to help them encourage them together so that they, if you have someone who's really, really top notch, they're going to want to get those bonus points. They're going to do what they can to get those bonus points, because they want all the points they could possibly have. And so if that means helping somebody who may be a little bit weaker in the group and working with them, the idea is to get them working together as well as to thinking about their own learning, learning thing. And you have to take that into account when um, this, how do you encourage cooperative learning? And we're going to talk about that in a second here. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Yesterday we were mentioning one of the factors that might be a difficulty when changing to active learning in the classroom. And one of them was that curricula demand that syllabuses are very extensive and encompass a lot of content. Salab I missed one of the words there. Syllabus? The syllabuses encompass a lot of... Syllabus. Syllabuses, yeah. Yes, yes, sorry. And... Um, all this leads to quantity versus quality uh, what, discussion. So what I mean, do you have to sacrifice some of the topics of your syllabus, of your syllabus okay. to, in order to have this in your classroom? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. If you think about it, if you're trying to cover a wide breadth of topics, you can't go very deep. It's very shallow when you're trying to do this wide breadth. What you do instead is say, OK, what are the trouble, what are the concepts that I've noticed my students have really struggled with in this course, in this content area? What are they really struggling with? That's where you want to use your hands-on time and your active learning, student-centered approach. Um, so that you can really spend some time, so you can get a better depth of understanding what's happening. So yes, in some cases you choose which one has, what areas you give more depth to. But one of the things is, is the trade-off is much bigger because they're better learners at those concepts. So yes, maybe you don't cover as much material. I mean, in introductory physics, we've got to cover this, 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 and this. Well, maybe we don't, what are things we could do? Well, do we do examples on the board? Well, yeah, we could do that. We could also provide, do videotape of us doing examples, videos to the students so they can watch them outside how we do the examples. They would love that. How do you do this problem? How do you do this problem? And having an expert work through it with them. And so you provide these, re you have to restructure where you spend your time and what resources you provide the students. So yes, you can do it all, but it takes time to, we're going to talk about this because I'm going to talk about how you do this kind of stuff later on in the talk. Other questions? Returning. These rooms are not made for lecturing, by the way, if you can't tell. You would only have a few minutes of lecture when you do things like this. 
Because let me guess, you guys are probably getting a little bored. She's talking and talking and talking. Anyway, so I want to talk more about this idea of team-based activities to encourage both social learning as well as helping you develop the processes on your own. So it's what we call cooperative learning. Uh, one major thing is I want to talk about size of teams. I've been in situations, we talk about active learning, we do these things, and I walk into a classroom, and they have six students working together, or ten students working together. Somebody says, that's too much. Yes, it's too much. I actually prefer teams of three to four. My ideal size is four. I'd rather have two teams of three than one team of five because three works better than four. The reason being is a very simple thing. If you actually have two larger teams, the students can become passive, sit back. They don't have necessarily a role. They don't have to be as actively involved. They can just let the core people do it. And they can sit back. And the students don't realize they're not really learning. They're not learning in the depth that they need to learn the material. They're thinking, oh, I observe this. Because we have this false belief that if we observe something happening, you know, like say I observe, um, where's Sebastian? Sebastian and um, Luana and Jeff and I were talking about cycling today, riding a bicycle. So if I observe him riding a bicycle, I can go right up and ride the bike, right? I've seen him do it. Everybody remember how long it took you to learn how to ride a bicycle when you were a little kid? And what did you start with? Training wheels, that's like the scaffolding we talked about yesterday. And then we slowly, after a little while, when we've developed confidence in our ability, but also in our parents have developed confidence in our ability, we can remove those training wheels and help them go and work on this information, um, do this kind of thing. You need to be active learning to do things like this. So we do work with teams, and they have to work together, and we do not want people being passive again. One of the things is they must be responsible for their own individual learning as well as for learning as a team. Some professors I've seen have done, um, when I was first involved um, in that course with 360 students in it, we, and they all worked in teams of four. And they would take the first half of their exam individually, turn the score in. And then once everybody had gotten their tests in, they'd send them back out, and they would work in a team to actually answer the questions again. So you discuss things back and forth, argue, well, I thought it was this, I thought it was this, oh, but this is the reason this, this, things. And so what they get is they get an average of those two scores. I've seen that work, where they're actually trying to, um, they're actually trying to encourage them to work together. As I said, I give an extra credit if the group average is above 80%. I found that works really well for my students. They really like, uh, it's what we call, what, uh, okay, Jeff's and Lana's and my mentor, Bob Beekner, who is the one who figured out the design of these rooms, um, called biscuit points. Biscuit points are a negligible amount of points that really make students feel good about themselves as they're getting them. You know, it's like a dog. You give them a biscuit. You can get a dog to do tricks if you give it a biscuit. And then eventually you don't have to give it the biscuit, but you do eventually. Yeah, they like those little treats. Okay, um, yesterday I talked about CatMe. It's this website for helping do team formation, also for doing, um, also doing things like um, peer evaluation of your team members, looking at things, also a lot of information about how teams can work together, and a lot of references on this website. So I wanted to actually give you the ref reference to the CatMe website. I know some, okay, I know the physicists, they weren't bothered listening to me, they just looked on their computers and said, oh, we got CatMe, what's going on with that? But no, so now we have the actual website, so give you a second to take that down. I want to also discuss about one of the other things I do to encourage active learning in my classroom. I don't want everybody sitting around frantically taking notes. I want them to be able to listen to me and figure out what's going on. So what I do, these are PowerPoint. I made them pretty basic because I just wanted to be able to make sure the technology worked. But what I do is I will 
provide um, copies of the notes. One of the nice things you can do in PowerPoint is print the slides with three slides on one page and the other thing on the other. Sometimes I don't include, what I don't include is sometimes I'll ask the groups questions. We'll do that and we'll come and have a class discussion or end Typically what I do is have the teams talk about it and then we come back together as a group and talk about it even further and help sure that they make sure they get the understanding that I'm trying to um, bring forth in them. And then other things that I do is I'll sometimes leave bits out. Like I'll leave a spot and I'll underline it so they know there's something missing. So they have to at least pay attention to get that, have, figure out where the missing parts are. But, but then they can do that and they can have their notes because then they have everything. Because I do a lot more than just what I put on my slides, as if you haven't realized that today. And so that gives them the opportunity to be taking notes as they want and figuring out what's important. Some students absolutely hate this because they view, oh, the only thing that's important is what I put on the screen. Do you think that's the only thing that's important for what we talk about? So we have to be aware of that. And so I want to just add that in there. OK. So I want to talk about at 2 PM today, uh, what we are doing this afternoon is odds are your class has already been assigned a classroom. Some of you may be in here. Some of you may be in the discussion rooms. We showed the pictures of early. And some may be in the lecture rooms. And we are going to be actually talking about in the afternoon sessions what are specific things you can do in these environments to help promote active learning. Um, I know that both Jeff and uh, Luana are doing actually going to have you actually try out an activity and how it can be done in this kind of situation. I'm actually going to just because it's a lecture room and there's so many challenges, it's obvious here. You can move the students around. You can do things. So many challenges with active learning in a lecture room that we're going to dis discuss how we set this up and things like that. But I wanted to do this as a little bit of advertisement for the, what we're doing this afternoon. One thing I want to just emphasize to you very well, active learning can be done in any classroom. You just have to be creative in how you implement it. Luckily, you have this entire support staff with Monica and Claudia and everything they run with. Uh, it's Project 50, is that what it's called in English? Project 50, that they're going to be here to be that support people that say, if you go to them and say, I'm not sure how I can do this, what are some ideas for incorporating active learning in this classroom? I've got these constraints and this stuff, and I don't know what I want it. I don't know how I can solve them. That's what the support people are there to help you with. OK. I think we switch gears. I have my pictures again. OK, so we're going to switch gears. So before we switch gears, are there questions on active learning or teamwork? Again, we're probably all going to go into more details about teamwork in the afternoon sessions, because it's such a key fundamental idea of doing active learning. See, I waited for a little bit longer there. The reason I waited for a little bit longer was because this is such an important thing that if you have questions before we go forward, I want to make sure you guys are right there. OK. So this is the part that I added based on my experience yesterday and seeing what you guys wanted and desired and actually needed in some cases. So you want to transform a course. You have these ideas that you have no clue how to do it. Or you have a little bit of clue because you've been coming to these kind of workshops, but you're still like, how do I do this in my course? OK, I, wanted, I, can, I could do an active learning activity, or I could do this, I could do that. But what's the process of transforming a course? OK, transformation. OK, sorry. So you want to do it? Here's my, um, here's my thing. I cannot emphasize, emphasize to you this more than that. I usually, when I'm giving this workshop, I jump up and down and go plan, 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 plan. But I'm on a mic, so that sort of caused weird noises and vibrations. So the thing is, it's plan. I can't emphasize as much. Start early, start planning. Transformation takes time. If you want to transform everything in the course, you want to create a new course, you want to do this kind of things, that takes time and planning. And you have to figure out and answer a lot of questions for yourself, working with your teammates, hopefully. Hopefully you're doing this on teams with your department. 
Um, we encourage that if you can do it. As Jeff was saying yesterday, that is so that you can, so if you do the teamwork, that means it's two people in the department are responsible. Share that, and that actually, or two people are actually helping working on it. And so, again, this whole idea, you are, as a team, you are greater than the sum of your individual parts. Okay. Think about course transformation. All right. Thing it is, is it can be either small scale. Say you have a class, it's a, a very specialized class, it's only for majors that's senior year. You've taught this course for the last um, four or five years. Pretty much your department said, you teach this course. You're specialized in this, you really understand the student population, you teach this course. And you came to this workshop, or these series of workshops, and you went, maybe I should do something, because the students aren't getting as much knowledge as I want. I want them to be able to graduate when they have this with a set, set of skills to say they actually graduate from EFIT, and I can guarantee when they go into future jobs or graduate school that they have a knowledge base that they can call on. So I want to be able to do that. And so you say, okay, I am just going to do a small scale transformation. I'm going to start incorporating things like, okay, we're going to do in-class problem solving. Have them work in groups of two, three or four and work together and figure out how to solve some prob real world problems. You might even have them even work outside of class, as long as it's structured. I mean, you can't just be passive. You have to have some in-class time. But you can do things where you say, okay, you guys are working as a team. You're going to learn to work as a team. This is a project I want you to do that's a more a larger project than you might be able to think about doing on your own. Uh, one of the things I've noticed here is there's a very large um, interaction between Purdue University and EFIT. Walked in the building yesterday, beautiful Purdue, Purdue University sign. I'm like sitting here going, so I had Sebastian take a picture of me because A, I'm a Purdue alumni, B, I am very closely tied to my former department as well as what's going on there, and I live in the same town as Purdue. So I did that. I mean, I'm back. I left and I came back. Uh, so what's happening is, you know, some of the things that are happening, I, uh, I was going to say, I'm missing what I was going to say, sorry. I was going to say Purdue really encourages stuff. They sometimes allow for options for doing large scale transformation. The idea, they have a program called IMPACT, which is for instruction matters. I don't remember the rest of it, but what it basically means is having the whole process is to take large lecture, large foundational courses, and we're talking over 500 students or more. You know, because the course I worked with had 900 students in the fall and 1,600 plus in the spring. So it, it's mind-boggling how big these are in some cases. But how can you bring this down to size with active learning and incorporate that? So these, this is something that a lot of people are doing. So I'm just saying you could do large scale like that. You're lucky here you don't have classes that have 900 students. You have separate sections. So maybe all the instructors, I was looking to see if um, the gentleman from yesterday was here that was talking about the separate, let me know that you guys will split it up so you only have like a maximum of 40 students in a section. Um, he unfortunately isn't here. But um, the thing is, is you can work with that. So why don't you grab all those other sections, professors, and you work together to sort of develop maybe more massive change. Do this. Okay. So I bet you're sitting there going, yeah, 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 whatever you say. I want to know how we do it, how we evaluate it, how do we sustain it, and how do we fund it. These are big fundamental questions. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer the how do we fund it as much because, frankly, I'm not as familiar with Columbian grants, Dean agencies, how the Ministry of Education works how funding is provided for, from the university for doing this kind of things. So I'm going to leave that one to more of the experts on that. However, um, and, and evaluating, I touched on that yesterday. So I'm going to really talk about this. How do we do it and how do we sustain it? Yes, sorry. Maybe you can mention the example of uh, how does it work in the United States, how you and I will do that. It's not directly in the slides, but I will, I, I will talk about this, yes. Okay, so this is what I talk about as the key aspects for any course transformation. You've got to develop it, 
you got to implement it, you got to evaluate it, and you got to sustain it. Um, a colleague of mine that I worked with, he had been um, asked to teach a course on um, modern physics for engineering, uh, engineering and technology majors at Purdue. And he was asked to flip the classroom. In other words, they did video lectures, and then once a week they would come to the classroom to ask the professors direct questions and such things and work on maybe some other activities. He really just had him come in and do a Q&A and problem solving session during, the situa during this time. And he, he got two grants to work on it from the university. One, a $10,000 grant to produce the videos using some of the um, really top-notch equipment and things that they um, offer at Purdue. One of the nice things is they've actually taken this, having to pay somebody to do it with you and making it much easier for you to do it yourself. It's an awesome situation. And then he implemented it, he evaluated it, he went back, did some, did some reforms on it, got another grant for $10,000. He had this idea of creating an app where he could send uh, multiple choice conceptual questions to students. So on your phone or your iPad, so as you're walking across campus, as jokingly said, he had the students could sit there and study as they're walking across campus and do questions and get feedback. Not necessarily problems they're going to be on the exams, but making sure because of modern physics, it's referring to a lot of topics. Um, one of the things that they do is um, use Schrodinger's equation. You all heard about Schrodinger's cat? Is it alive or dead? Maybe not. It's a physics joke for those he got it. Um, but anyway, the thing is, as with that situation, uh, he is doing all this stuff, and he teaches it for the second or third time. And the, the idea was that because he's invested all this time and the university money in developing this course, he gets to continue it. Well, Mitch Daniels, our president at Purdue, sort of got involved and said, we really don't need a college of tech. We, we need a college of technology, but we're going to change how it works. He introduced this idea of a polytechnic institute, where students are not graded on um, courses necessarily. They take mastery courses, where they have to master the material, and they go through and they have to create. And the, instead of being the typical four years to graduate college, they actually only take three. So the department decided to kill this course completely. They sort of assigned it to another professor who said, no, no, we got to treat it like it's physics, not the other professor said, how can we do these applications of modern physics for engineers and technology majors that are directly relevant to their life? Uh, my point here is like, it really stinks if you spend all this time, you rotate out of the class, you move away from the class and you want to come back to it, or you're trying to help somebody on the side, and they're not really doing a good job of sustaining the class. So that's a really important aspect that we cannot forget about. Because I can tell you the frustration is horrible. When you sit there and you realize you have created this thing. You have spent your blood, sweat, and tears doing this. And somebody else takes it and they butcher it. Sustainability is important. OK. So I want people to start asking those questions. What, what type of transformation do you want to do? Just a large scale, small scale? What type of buy-in will you need? This is important. You have control of your class and your section. However, if you're doing all this work and saying, ah, oh, and really believe that active learning is the way to go and uh, student-centered and everything, and you want to make a shift, you may need to create a new course. You may need to get fa other faculty members on board. That's why I say work in a team together. More faculty members, more support. You may need to get the entire department. This is something, a uh, course transformation that I was involved with as a consultant outside, and then I came and worked it for you with it, um, was actually this thing that where they needed to do it to get buy-in. They actually had to get buy-in. This course was required for all engineering majors. So I had to get buy-in from the engineering programs that this is appropriate course. And this new way of thinking about physics is how, what we should be doing. And so they did that. The problem was they didn't get the entire department's, entire department's buy-in. And now the department's saying, we don't like how this is. I know they get these other benefits and all these great benefits, but our majors are not fully developed because you're calling um, Newton's second law, the momentum principle. And our students get confused. 
And I'm like, okay, just make sure you emphasize it more in the lectures. Don't get, you know. And I actually talked to the, uh, authors of the textbook we use, and I said, you got to emphasize this more. This is a, a complaint that we have to get over. You might also need your deans, your presidents, provosts, having their feedback and that support. You want to develop something that the university can sort of brag about, that they are proud of, that they can actually go out to other universities. Sort of like when I was able to talk about these classrooms with these chairs, they're very similar to this with the little desks that come over. People were excited about this when I presented this at the poster last week. They were excited about having this opportunity for classrooms because you can do regular lecture. They all like lecture. And then, ooh, we could do group work that way. We do that. It's, you want to design something and have it be something that people are in the university are going to be proud of and that you are going to be proud of and your students are going to enjoy. Not only the learning, but they're going to enjoy the learning. So um, you also need to figure out what you want to transform and why. What kind of course are you looking at? So I want to give you some development goals before I set you loose a little bit. OK. I've talked long enough. So when you, you have goals, remember we talked about course goals yesterday. Goals such as what do we want the students to learn, what kind of uh, abilities we want them to gain, not just necessarily content knowledge, but also social, um, uh, active learning, different things like that, technology, attitudes and appreciation, things like that. What were you talking about transformation goals? So these are slightly simpler. What do you want to accomplish with this transformation? I want to transform this course, whatever your insert, whatever number, whatever it is, so that blah. What are the students wanting to do? I want to do this. How do you want to, what do you want to accomplish with it? You want to allow students a more in-depth learning environment, perhaps, be able to go into more detail, have me there so when they're doing, struggling with the content, I can, I or maybe a learning assistant can really help with their actual mastery of the content. Um, one of the other questions is, how much time are you actually going to be allowed? I know there's a, so there are a series of, um, there is a, a groups of teams of you who apply to actually do some transformation and work closely with Project 50. I know you guys are one, what is that program called, excuse me? Sorry, Claudia, yes. What is it called? Active learning, and there's 12 groups that are doing this, and part of the idea is to transform the course. And this is a year-long program. It's a semester doing the planning at the beginning. Okay, so that's how much time you have. What can you do in the time? I'm going to tell you, some of these transformations, you're going to do it, you're going to say, I really like this, I don't really like this, okay, I'm going to come back to it. Or I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and sometimes, like this Purdue course that I was involved in, they started transforming it in probably 1998. And they've continued with the transformation. And they're continuing transforming the course. And we're getting better and better at how we teach it. But this is concentrated effort with asking these transformation questions from different things from 98 all the way up to today. So that's like 20 years almost working with it. So you got, it is a continual process. Okay, what do you need to do it? People are like, I need money. I need buyout time. I need time to create this course. I need not to be enrolled and busy teaching, working 68 hours a week trying to do this stuff. I need the time. It's usually a big thing. Or I need money. I want to buy equipment for the students. <coughs> Things like this. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. There you go. What about the hidden curriculum? What it means? Hidden curriculum. Um, okay. Hidden curriculum um, is a few slides later. <laughs> but I have an activity because you because I have talked long enough. All right. 
working in teams of three at your wonderful scale up tables, which allow us to all work together. We got, I like how you guys all said, oh, we're in a team of three. We're in a team of three. You're all sitting in threes. What? Yes. We're a little bit short over here. Um, and one, two, three, one, two, three. We are very close to having almost perfect teams of three. If you need to work in a group of four, that's okay. But I would prefer three just because of the nature of these tables. Um, you might find it more, in, are, you in the, are you in their team? They're doing physics and they're all in the same department. So you may want to work over there. Okay, so I want you to be thinking about these issues. We only have about 15 minutes to spend on this, okay? Some things are just assumed or applied. Okay. I often taught this introductory astronomy course for non-technical majors. Spent 10 years, 12 years of my life teaching this course. I love this course. One of the things that I did when I taught this course is that many of the faculty members said, oh, just go show pretty pictures, have them memorize a few facts, test them on those facts, and that's it. And I said, no, wait a minute. All these pre-service teachers are in this course and they're going to have to teach this contact to our, our children. And these are some of the hardest concepts to teach to our children. We have plenty of evidence that's not working. So if I can teach them and sort of demonstrate it in an active learning space of how I want them to teach, then it's more likely that we're going to have better, well-rounded, more intelligent, or more, um, they get a higher mastery, our children have a higher mastery of some of these more difficult concepts like phase of the moon, seasons, things like that. And so, um, some of, no, 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 I mean, even from the very beginning, when I started teaching at Kansas State, and they hired me to come in and teach their astronomy course, they said, oh, don't worry, you can cover anything you want, you can do whatever you want, this is like, we don't really care, none of these students are going to take more physics, they're not going to do that. Turns out, yes, the students are going to take more physics, they like physics, they're going to take more, and if they like astronomy, they may have to become an astronomy major or physics major. I don't know how many physics majors I've had come out of my astronomy courses. These are non-technical majors are undecided to decide they want to do this. So, I mean, it's like, but the professors that think, oh, they come in with a philosophy that's like, I don't think the students are smart enough to handle this in real. So it's sort of like play or baby physics or baby astronomy. If you have, if you find yourself having this internal dialogue with yourself, You've got to consciously overcome that bias or that negativity because it comes across to your students and it becomes part of the hidden curriculum. By hidden, it means all these things that are sort of implied or inferred or things like that about what you're doing and why you're doing it. One of the things um, a lot of people have is this mental dialogue that goes in case. I want my students to learn. We all agree with that? We want our students to learn? Everybody agree? Want, want our students to learn. We're doing kinesthetic activities. Let's raise our hands. We all want, want our students to learn. Okay, I want them to enjoy learning. We all want that? Yes. I want my students to like me. You don't care. To enjoy science. That is the only thing. You know, I want them to enjoy science. A lot of us have, um, when you work at a university or school that, where they have a high emphasis on student teaching evaluation, and that's, that's how they're going to evaluate your teaching, that's the only metric they're going to use to evaluate your teaching, you want your students to like you. <laughs> and maybe some other people really just want their students, we all want to be, you know, some of us require, you know, we want to be liked. You know, I, that's like I tell dumb jokes. I want you guys to A, remember my dumb jokes as a way to connect the information. Uh, remember the information I'm teaching you, but also as a way that if you laugh, I'm thinking, oh, they like me, this is going well, good. So these kind of things, you have to be thinking of what are you trying to put into this. I want my students to learn. And you consciously think about how do I get my students to learn this material. 
What do I know about how I learned? What does research say about how students learn this? Because remember, we are not our students. We were better students than them when we were in college. So we wouldn't all be teaching college now if we hadn't been. Okay, so that is what the hidden curriculum is. Is there any questions on hidden curriculum? And if you're interested more and learning more about hidden curriculum, I do have a chapter in a book I can recommend on this. Okay. I just want to go over a few things in more in the development scales. So once you figure out what course you want to do, what your timeline is, and the key times you feel you need to meet them. Like when am I going to talk to my, when am I going to go forward with this and get the approval of my department? Or when I'm going to try and get the approval of the engineering school or the other schools that are taking departments that are taking your courses and requiring it? Because they're your customers. I say customers, not that students are really truly customers. The other other schools are, are sending their students to you. They are your customers. So people, you know, like engineering is a customer for physics. They really care what we teach them. So we better do a good job, or they're going to say no. In America, engineering, the way the accreditation is, they can say we don't like how you're teaching our students. We're going to teach it ourselves. And this actually happened at my old university uh, after I left, where the engineering school came up and said, you're not doing a good job in how you teach physics. Maybe rightfully so. Um, and so what they did is they said they decided to teach the physics. And so they had all these people come in and evaluate it and try to see if that really worked. But here we go. There's a whole population of engineers that aren't taking physics from physics professors. And this was really this item of concern. So they are you're doing that one. OK, so set about your goals, so how much it's going to take. OK, how much time do you estimate it's going to take you to do this transformation? Double it, quadruple it, keep multiplying it. It's going to always take a lot longer than you assume. Until you get very, like as we were saying, the activity creation that I try to do. So this activity creation that I'm trying to do this activity development, and I do this, and I want to implement it in my class, and I'm still the center of everything. And you get this frustration, because everything takes a lot longer than you have to do it. And the larger the scale, the more time it's going to take. OK. Things to remember. Set up a development schedule. Adhere to the development schedule as best you can. Allow plenty of time. Some development things take a year to plan out. Some require a semester. If you're doing conscious planning during that, that's what most people do is they do a whole semester and plan out. But in some cases, for example, a project I'm working at with um, some physics professors down at Western Kentucky University, um, they have a semester to plan the stuff, and then they're realizing they're going to have to create an entire new course with a new course number for what they want, because they're going to transform the engineering um, physics course so radically that they're going to need a new course completely, because it's so different. Um, again, learn the objectives. Never lose sight of what your end goals are. You're doing this because you want to help your students learn. You're doing this because you want to help them enjoy learning. You don't want them sitting in the back of your lecture hall sleeping because they're so bored. But attendance is required to. Anyway, again, it takes a long time. And they oftentimes do not ha work the first time, not perfectly. And you've got to keep going back and refining it and learning from your process. That's why evaluation is so important. You've got to evaluate it, come back, look at it, do things like that. Okay, here are some of the things that I found that are somewhat problematic. So they decide they want to transfer this course. And they said, you know what? We're going to try it out with this section of the students, with these 40 students, and maybe these two or three sections. Everybody else is going to do something different. Here's the problem with that. You have what's called a guinea pig effect. Is anybody, do people know what guinea pigs are? OK, yes, testing. They do testing on guinea pigs. <laughs> and they say, 
if the students say, I'm doing a special section, then the students that are being new section on, if they perceive it as easier or better, they're going to feel like they're going to be happy with it. The other students are going to really resent that the other people get an easier or better version. If it's the reverse, where the students are feeling this is more work because they're more actively involved in it, and they're doing more of their work inside the class, outside of the class, then they're going to feel like we're being tested on and doing things like this. So it's really care. Like when Purdue decided to make this transformation of this course back in uh, 2005, I believe it was, I actually referred to them and said, this is, we had a grad student at the University of Ibadan who did an evaluation of this, and we discovered the guinea pig effect. It's so radically different that you need to have, basically do it, what we call whole hog, sorry to use the word pig and hog in the same sentence, but, and do a total implementation. Because you're gonna run into, you don't wanna run into this guinea pig. All right. Will you make changes during the implementation stage? A lot of people wanna do active learning, I mean, active research where they are coming in, they say, oh, this is a problem, let me recreate this activity as I go. You have to ask yourself the questions. Will you have the time to do this? And more importantly, are you going to spend the time to do it? Because you may have it, but if you have other more important things to do, like I need to go home and have dinner with my family, I'm going to do that over spending a couple hour, extra hours in the office working on something. So these are, be honest with yourself. And then think about how you're going to assess. assess again, this is all in the evaluations and assessment. These are bringing in to some of the things that we're doing, we talked about yesterday. Okay, I mentioned this idea of expectation violation yesterday. I wanted to actually give you a reference. Um, my reference is a little off because John Gaffney is no longer at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, he is actually at a university in New York. I'm not sure which, unfortunately. But if you look, put in John Gaffney expectation violation into Google Scholar, you will get his papers on this about expectation violation. It, expectation violation is a communication theory that deals with how individuals respond when put in unexpected situations. I.e., your students walk into this classroom. I mean, I know that Monica shared when the professor who was using the classroom for the first time, and the students walked in and had no idea how they were supposed to learn in the classroom. What am I supposed to do? Where do I sit? I want to make sure I can see the person talking. So if I spend the whole entire time talking like this, I'm in the front of the classroom. I'd actually spend it up there if I was going to be in the front of the classroom. They have no idea what's going on, and they can get very frustrated when you do something like this. So be aware. What are my students going to expect from this course? What would they expect this course in the past? Things like that. As I said, frame the course appropriately. If you're going to be doing a lot of activities, again, you might want to say integrated lecture and activities, or we're doing this active learning environment. You're going to be doing lecture is going to be kept very small. It's all about you guys working together, things like this. Frame the course. Um, also provide scaffolding, getting those training wheels. It helps them adjust. Okay. I'm going to get to the sustainability. I'm sorry I'm speeding through things. I have a few more things I want to make sure I get to at the end and have time for you guys to work some stuff. Okay, so sustainability. How do you get things to sustain? Things happen. Um, for example, with the Purdue project, one professor has been involved with this transformation project. Actually, multiple professors have been involved in this transformation project over since 2007, constantly. Sometimes the developers are saying, I want to do something new. One of the developers said after a few years, I think we've really mastered this and I think everything's going smoothly after all these years. I want to work on another course and transform that course. So I sometimes get bored. Also, sometimes, this is what happened at the Purdue course. When they set it up, they had all these, this is how you should do this, this is how you should do that, this is what's going on. And then other professors started being in uh, charge of the course. And all of a sudden, pedagogical memories are being lost. So we go from these really uh, complex real world problems that we had groups solve to Oh, let's just have homework-like problems the groups are solving, or teams are solving. If you have a team solve a problem, they can solve on their own. And this exactly is what happened. Okay, you do part A, you do problem one, you do problem two, you do problem three, and I'll do problem four. And they all work on their individual problems. 
and then it comes back together. And they get them checked off that they got the problems right. Not working, okay? Work together in a team, that was the solution. Uh, work with other professors. Keep good records. Not only is this what I did, this is if it worked or not. The whole idea of journaling, somebody suggested yesterday, great idea. But also, this is why I did it. You can't remember what you did. It's got to be coupled with why you're doing it. So that somebody else who's taking, taking over the course or working with you, under, hopefully they can do an apprenticeship model where you're, you work with them and you two are both teaching similar courses and you can work with them together. But oftentimes that doesn't happen. So you need to be able to say, this is why we do what we do. Because as I said earlier, if it's not sustained and you spent so much quality, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, you're going to be frustrated. OK. Questions before I move on to the last few parts? Yes. Excuse me. Let me turn my ears on. Spanish, yeah. Eh, me he dado cuenta y ahora conversaba con, con las colegas aquí en la mesa que cuando uno está haciendo la transformación todos somos ingenieros o todos somos economistas o todos somos geólogos o astrónomos y estamos hablando de cómo implementar las estrategias eh, uno está como muy metido dentro del bosque y no ve como los árboles. Es, es importante como entrar a otras disciplinas o beber de otras disciplinas o ir donde un profesor, por ejemplo, de creatividad o donde un diseñador gráfico o donde una persona que maneja, eh, eh, que es capaz de hacer videos o animaciones o motion graphics o cosas por el estilo para que te dé nuevas ideas. ¿En qué momento recomiendas tú que uno vaya a beber de esas otras fuentes y se asesore de otras personas que no tienen nada que ver con lo que uno está haciendo aparentemente, pero que te dan las grandes ideas para hacer actividades que son significativas en el aula? What I would say in answer to that question, I would say plan, 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 plan. During the planning stages is when you should do this. Or during the, um, if you're having, you're saying, okay, we've done this, this worked, this didn't work. It would be so much better if I actually had professional or semi-professional videos of me giving the lecture so students could watch these online. Okay. Your university has resources for that, or I assume they do. And people like Claudia and Monica, if they're not in the room now, they're built, there's Monica. She's Working with this, their help, they're gonna, their, their job is to help support you doing this. They want to be the people that help you do this. And they say, I want to do this. So you try and figure out how to do it. They may contact somebody like me and say, we're having this issue, we're having this question. How do you do it? Or do you have any ideas to help them? One, I'm going to actually change my slide because you just tied into my slide. Okay. What we are doing for this is we are creating a professional development community for every single one of you. Anybody who showed up to any of these workshops and frankly to anybody who's also interested at this university and even throughout the world who's interested in doing active learning questions, having this kind of support. What that we're doing with this is there is, for those of you that are online, you might want to, okay, yes, escape. I'm going to go on the web. And I'm going to go to this website. Okay. Help. Oh, I just clicked the first one because, okay, I'm. Uh, And you'll be able to actually join this afterwards. We're only in the process of getting this set up, but um, I know that people have been passing around a little sign-in sheet. Does that include your email address? To, so you guys have their email addresses for everybody? 
So what is going to happen, once we finish setting this up, which we start on this morning, they change how you do the steps. It's a little bit more complicated. I'm going to log into my account so I can show you some of the things of what this does. OK. So you can create an account. So once you'll be given a number and said, please access this account. When, so Monica will send you an email, and you can click on it. They'll ask you to join this site. This is a really, what this is, is it's a classroom management system similar to like Blackboard or Canvas or anything like that. But unlike these normal original uh, course management systems, this one actually integrates social interaction within it. It actually has a front page, as you'll see as I type this in. Um, why? OK. So in this case, I have access to all of the courses. OK, yes, I'm accepting Monica's class request, if I can. So we have created this course. We don't have any content up there yet. So I'm going to go back to another course and show you the kind of things we can do with it. So how many people are familiar with Blackboard, or not, excuse me, Facebook? Facebook. And everybody, we don't really like Facebook, but you know about it. I have one friend that if she posts 10 posts a day, it's a short amount of posts that she's doing. She's like, posts all the time. She's at work and she's posting. I'm like, you can't do that at work. Anyway, so. Uh, this is a course I worked with. I worked with Andy Gavrin, who is one of the developers of Just in Time Teaching. Just in Time. Yes. Anyway, so what it. I'm having problems because it's a PC and I'm having problems. Okay. Okay. Very backwards from what I do. But what it is, is that um, if you look at posts, Students are actually going around and making posts. Somebody asked when, the, this is from the last week of the semester. And somebody's asking when, help me. OK. All right, I'm just going to show this. Um, you shouldn't be seeing the student names, but this one student is one of the best students. We nicknamed him Rob. He actually puts this post up. And I can't really see it, so I'm going to actually make it larger. OK, this is a picture of Professor Gavin from the 1970s. He still has long hair, but he doesn't look like this. So the student went out and found this picture on the web. And one of the you know, things don't disappear. And he posts it to the whole class. And, um, and what he says is that, I have the deep honor to nominate you for membership in the Long Flowing Hair Club for Scientists. The respected Dr. Andrew D. Gavrin, one look at his photo contains all. We started teasing him. He felt comfortable teasing his professor. Now, we have a joke in physics that if you want to be a stereotypical physicist, A, you have to be male, B, you have to be older, and you're either bald or have really fuzzy hair <laughs> that does really wacko things. But anyway, so there's things like this. Students can do this in a course. Um, I got to come back and do the other course. Course I've created for professional development for my other. So in one of my other courses that I've done, I I did a course on introduction to physics education research. And so I set up all tasks I wanted students to do, but I allowed them to post and comment and share and interact with each other. One of the things we found from the IUPUI data is that women and underrepresented minorities are more likely to use the interface to connect, partially because women are often outnumbered four to one in a physics class. 
80% male, 20% female. So I feel very alone, and I feel like maybe they're not as respected, because a lot people, you know, I've had men who, like, I make a comment, they'll go, ugh, you know, or ask a question in class. It's sort of discouraging. So we need it. This will help encourage that interaction. But here I have a thing where I said, okay, welcome to it. We're going to talk about week one. We're going to talk about doing, working with IRB, Institutional Review Boards, and what this means, and gives the links to Purdue, and different things like that. The thing about this course is it's out there. Somebody can actually find my course and ask to join it, and I can approve them. They just want to learn about the material, and they want to do the readings that I'm doing and the papers I put in it at the end. That way we can, they can learn. The idea here is I have a number of books. I'm going to have these available. Um, some of them are the same. Others are... Okay, oh, there's the one book. I'm like, where's my other copy? Uh, that are here. I'm going to put these out online, but I want to share some of the books we have. Uh, for those of you going to the lecture session this afternoon, we're going to learn a little bit more about this just-in-time teaching, how you can ask your students and get feedback from your students on their learning before you walk into the classroom. And this is actually across the disciplines. They have another book that's just for physics. Engaging in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Most of these books are English. Sorry. Um, things like that. Uh, we have another book called How Learning Works. Remember I said you may want to research how your students learn and different things like that. And this has seven research-based principles for smart teaching. This book I bought because I thought it was a guide to teaching active learning. It's called A Guide to Teaching in the Active Learning Classroom. Turns out the people who wrote this were from the University of Minnesota. Okay, and one of the things the University of Minnesota did was they outfitted, they actually created a building containing 10 of these scale-up classrooms, as well as other interactive learning rooms where people can work together. And this is all about what the lessons they learned while doing this, because they had an entire course on this. What? University of Minnesota. And that was all based on the work of Bob Beekner. So they actually have an official name for it, just like Purdue is building their building, has an official name for it. I just call them Beekner buildings, because Beekner designed these classes. Let's give some credit where credit is due. So it should all be Beekner buildings, but whoever pays the building actually gets the credit. Anyway, so these books are up here. They will be available, and we actually, we, these are the only ones we brought, okay? We have a lot more of these at home, and we'll be putting these kind of resources. If you find something, once we get the whole professional development community up and running, if you find something like, oh, I found this article, you can actually do that. I believe they do have translation features here as well. So if you need it to actually translate it from my English to your Spanish or from your Spanish to my, so I'm gonna, we'll be able to interact this. The course networking is also global. So if there are other professional development communities like this in the world, we can actually link with them and you can share with what we're learning with what the world is learning. And so this is a really, it's a very easy to go to site. It's also free, 100% free, no premier site, anything like that, 100% free. The way they make their money is they get the universities to adopt it, to interact it, it's a direct course management system. Uh, like for example, in Malaysia, the Malaysian Secretary of Education, actually, I think they're in the process of doing this. I don't know if he actually did it. They're actually approving this to actually be used classroom management system for the entire country of universities and colleges in Malaysia. So everybody was using this. We have all these different things coming in. Okay, questions? You want to come up here and play? You want to talk about your transformation? You want to talk to me? Yes. Sorry, I have to turn my ears on. I'll grab my ears. Uh, I'm gonna, in English, if you... English? Yeah. Uh, one of my concerns that when we think in preparing active activities, let's say, so uh, we need as a basis that guarantee that students prepare the basic knowledge. So this is, for me, this like the, the threshold when you can do those activities and then you have to prepare the way they are going to learn before the activity. 
what would be the best recommendation? Because we don't want to increase, let's say, for example, the, the tests, the exams, the quizzes, because that's the nature of, OK, you prepare this, you read that, or you see the videos, and then how can I guarantee that you prepare that before starting the activity without uh, increasing the number of exams or quizzes? So for example, with just-in-time teaching, if you start working with that, you have the students actually have to prepare for class, doing some of the readings, doing some of the problems, actually answering quiz questions or things like that. You can then read through the responses. You don't have them turn it in at 8 a.m. in classes at 10.30. You have it do it the night before at like 9 o'clock. And then you can go on at 9 or 10. You're looking at me very scared. <laughs> what is she doing? Anyway, so that you can go in there and say, oh, are they going to be ready for this activity? Or maybe they're not quite ready. I have to spend some more time talking about this component. So this can assure you that you're there, this is a way you could do it to make sure the students are actually ready to perform. Other things you can do is do pre-tests, clicker questions in the classroom. I often will do things, see where they are. We talk about the. I have one thing where I do a clicker question, get it started, and then I, and we look at what the results are. And I say, okay, it sounds like we need, they're like, what's the answer? I don't know. And I'll say, I don't know, you tell me, and I'll hand out the activity. But they're, what I'm doing is priming the pump. Getting them, they're actually, by asking the question they don't necessarily know the answer to. They're now wanting to be more actively involved in solving that problem. Different things like that. Are there questions? I want to put my email contact information up here, and I encourage Luana and um, Jeff to do it as well. OK, pink is not going to show up. Can I have a blue marker? Blue. Green was too faded yesterday, sorry. I did this. OK, so we're going to put up our email addresses and contact information. I should have a slide, but I don't. I apologize for this. Luana, Jeff, are you still right in the other room? OK, note when parking on the side. Do not do this and try and do it, because you end up writing an angle. So before you come in here and you have to write on the board, practice, practice, practice. I do mostly PowerPoints. And so my boards, I usually do it at a lot smaller. Oh. So we want to put our three email addresses up there. And then I'll have you put the website. Okay. And all three of us are going to join the professional development community that Monica has set up. And so you can also contact us through that. But if you have, look at how nicely Luana is doing. Learn from my mistakes. Um, sorry. Um, and so you can start learning and figuring out what these kinds of things are. We will also post all of our slides in on this website. We'll be able to link them on there so you can go in and you can actually download the files your, the, yourself. Now, Luana's going to be getting a new email soon, which is 
at the science education stem education solutions.com I haven't gotten I haven't sent mine out so I'm I'm still at tilly.com they work they both go to the same place so our website is stem ed solutions.com do you remember stem education solutions Yes, questions. You look like you have a question. Nope. Questions. Excuse my messy handwriting. Um, questions. I also have copies of, we all have copies of, at least Jeff and I have copies of our business cards. And if you have trouble reading it, I can write it down on your dry erase board too. <laughs> I know it's difficult to estimate, but is there any, based upon your experience, to estimate any rule of thumb of how many times do we need to plan, uh, for example, let's say for a two-hour session, in your experience, can we estimate how much amount of time do we need? Or? For one session or for an entire course that meets two hours of a semester? I'm talking about a little transformation because <laughs> the entire course is the 20 year transformation you just yeah, mentioned. Maybe just take a week or two to be looking at it. If you guys, all, you guys, it sounds like you guys are already talking about this. Yeah. So what you can do is you can leave here, since you're all working together and you're all in physics and you also have this, uh, you're participating in the active learning teams, you'll be able to sort of work together and sort of say, okay, this is what I want to do and figure this out and sort of start roughing this idea out. And so it may be something that you can, if you put a lot of work into it, maybe two weeks, maybe you take it a little bit easier. So you put it, sometimes you say, okay, I want to do this for this activity on this day that's three weeks away. And sometimes you got to cram at the end. It's better not to cram. It's better to plan, 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 plan. And I say often, I say, do as I say, not as I do. Because I've been known to cram, cram, cram to get everything in for a given day. So it just depends on what your style of working is. Yeah, you. I had a comment to that. Yeah. So, are you your science background? So, just just those who are, would do physical science or hands-on activities, regardless of the discipline, um, make sure the equipment works. Believe it or not, um, if you have a chance to try it out, if you have grad students or uh, TAs for the course? TAs, yes. Um, or your colleagues, go through it, okay. Make sure the equipment works. <laughs> if you come to my session this afternoon, um, you'll get an example of, of that. Um, thank you. One thing I would follow up with that is, um, when I first started writing my astronomy activities, I was actually working at Kansas State University. And what I ended up doing was I hired a student that was helping me with some things, but she is someone I met out of my astronomy class. I ended up hiring her the next semester to help with this development. It was almost like a paid average student. So there was a situation once where I was looking at this activity, I was basing on somebody else's activity, and they talk about things like um, an orrery view of the solar system versus a uh, geocentric view. And she's like, and then it's like ori or the you know whatever and she's like why do you call it ori do we need to memorize this term do we need to do that why don't you just call it a solar system view it's easier to understand and i went we often talk about keep it simple stupid the kiss method in the u.s keep it simple stupid if there's an easier way to say something or to explain it use the easiest way possible unless it's something that you want them to learn vocabulary words then you may want to use the vocabulary words in context. I don't know, do you guys have your students learn vocabulary words? Maybe in the foreign language classes or in biology classes, but I'm not sure, kind of things like that. Other questions? Oh, where's the other question? Oh, she's back in from the foreign language? Oh, Jeff has a question or a suggestion. Since most of my teaching is done in an environment where basically I have a flipped classroom, we're, doing, we're pretty much doing, I lecture very little and most of the time the students are doing activities. 
In that case, what I usually do is I usually overplan each class. I, and what I mean by overplan is on individual activities, I have an extra section that students can do in case if they if I have one group faster than the rest of the class. And I like to present that little extra part that they do that maybe other students don't do at the, at the end of the activity. And sometimes I'll give them some uh, either bogus points or bonus points, depending on how I've set up the class. Biscuit points. Biscuit points. Well, well. I recall that. But the other thing I do is I, I, have plan, I can pretty much plan how much material I can cover, how many activities I can do. Sometimes the class will move a little bit slower. Sometimes the class will move a little bit faster. So I typically plan for an extra, for a two-hour class, I typically plan for an extra half hour. I very rarely use it, but it's there just in case I need it, because I'd rather have it and not use it than, in, than have extra time, have basically let the students go early. Any other questions or comments? Maybe this would be a good time. Well, can you, can you, I'm like, sure, sure, I'll, exactly I'll go ahead and do that. To, so. On your tables, um, you should have index cards. Are they there? No, no they're going to pass them out in just a moment. Um, so one activity you can do at the end of a class, or at the beginning of a class, maybe if you give a, if you give a quiz on a reading or a, a pre-course, so you give them some homework to prepare for class, and maybe you do a little fo follow-up quiz in class to, to see if they've done that. Um, but the key point, mostly end of class, what you do is, and you pass these out ahead of time, is you pass out these index cards, and you ask the students to write down, I'm going to ask you to write down your most pressing question that you still have. And we will try to address and this. And it's a low-tech way to get some feedback. You collect them at the end of class, and say you collect these on Friday, then you go through them over the weekend, and you have some feedback for how you want to address, how you want, want to plan your class out for Monday. What, you know what questions the students have. Uh, you may have a better feeling for what the students have gotten or not gotten from your last week of class. And you can use that feedback then to plan your Monday's class. <laughs> 